everybody. So this is your second lecture for your anatomy and physiology, and we cover solute and water transport and uh, membrane channels, pumps, and transporters. So hopefully you guys enjoy this lesson, and uh, keep in mind this is uh, actually quite important to understand, especially as we move forward when we're talking about treatments and uh, pharmacology. Have fun. All right. So welcome to your second lecture. So this one is going to be primarily about uh, transporter pumps and solute and water transport. And these are quite important to understand, especially when we're talking about um, how we're going to be treating most of these patients when we're talking about dehydration, if we're talking about traumatic brain injuries, or we have somebody who maybe has uh, intracranial swelling and we're using sodium bicarb as a means of reducing, <coughs> excuse me, uh, reducing the swelling. So these are important concepts to understand. And so that's why we're going to go over them kind of early on in your anatomy and physiology. <clears throat> first thing we're going to talk about, we're going to talk about uh, the solutes and how they cross the cell membrane. We're going to explain the charge, the size, the solubility, and how they affect the movement across the cell membrane. We're going to compare and contrast how transporters, pumps, and channels work. And we're going to describe how ion channels are gated. All right, so we're going to do a little bit of a recap. Uh, just to kind of reinforce what you guys learned yesterday and tie it into what we are learning today. So in every cell membrane, uh, we have uh, basically surrounds each cell, we have this membrane and we call this a hydrophobic barrier because it has, it repels water and it repels all the solutes and ions that are associated with it. On the top here, we have our polar heads and these are our phosphate heads as well as they're attached to fatty chain tails. And they're attached by a glycerol chain kind of backbone that essentially acts like a glue. Now, the top portion here is, is hydrophilic. And philic essentially means loving or liking or attracted to, okay? And that means it wants water and its components, okay? And then we have the phobic portion, which is the fatty acid chain. So we ever put oil and water together? Uh, they, don't, they don't really mix very well. So uh, they kind of separate themselves off. And that's kind of what the fatty acid chains do is they kind of repel that water out. So basically they're water fearing. Okay. And this means that they repels water and its components. So basically that, but repels it. Now, physiologic processes are controlled by signals that come from the extracellular space. So outside the cell here, this is where all the signals come from. And this could be a signal maybe from cells that are growing. It could be signals that maybe there's a metabolic process happening. Maybe apoptosis, that sort of thing. And maybe sensory perception. So what this means is this is taking in your surroundings and relaying or signaling that information for homeostatic control. So basically what your cell is doing is it's sensing these things in order to sense a change in homeostasis. <coughs> so what's going to happen there is this is going to basically send the signal, if there's a change, to your brain, right? Just like we talked yes or about yesterday about the feedback loops. And its goal is to bring about that change. And what these do, what the cells do specifically, is they convert chemical energy for ionic energy, okay? And, sorry, that was actually the wrong one, ionic energy. And this signals the nervous system impulses and <clears throat> there's kind of that information that goes along with it, okay? So reason why these are important and what we're gonna talk about in the channels themselves, why it's important, is because it's the basis for all disease. Okay, I shouldn't say all disease. It's a basis of some, actually most diseases. So we could have essentially defective, we could have defective transporters. And this is things like we see in cystic fibrosis. And that means that there's a lack of water movement as a result of aquaporon dysfunction and that leads to sclerosing of the lung tissue. Or we could have something like defective channels. And that is 
maybe something like long QT syndrome or paralysis. We have a defective channel that is either not functioning or functioning too much, and it's creating uh, uh, some sort of pathology. But another portion of these channels, and this is a huge portion of your, your what you guys will learn in the next semester, is it's the basis of pharmacology or pharmacology. Many drugs that we utilize are going to be acting on these channels because we want the drugs to get into the, the cells themselves. So things like antihypertensives, okay? Um, if we want to diurese, okay, we, we utilize channels for that. How about uh, stomach ulcers? Uh, you know, proton pump inhibitors, as an example for pharmacology, okay? All of these are going to affect one of the channels that we're going to talk about. So let's talk about those channels. All right. So what we're going to talk about first is we're going to talk about diffusion and we're going to review a little bit about the gap junctions in cells. And really when we talk about material that enters the cell and it goes down by its concentration gradient. Okay. So there's a concentration gradient. And usually what that means is we have essentially a high amount of something on one side and we have essentially a low amount or none on another side of the spectrum and it is based on a spectrum and usually there is some sort of membrane kind of in the middle that is preventing this from happening and this we usually call the plasma membrane okay and the goal of the movement of the concentration or of the ions to, to move down this concentration gradient is to equalize, because it always likes equality. So it's going to equalize the concentration on either side because it loves that balance, okay? So that is what is normally supposed to happen in microbiology. Now, any molecule that is soluble and can easily pass across a membrane will diffuse, okay? And when we talk about uh, movement of particles and it's the random free flow of particles themselves, it's not like they have a directional arrow saying, hey, go this way, right? It's just random free movement and it's basically gonna cross that membrane in order to balance things out on either side, okay? And when we're talking about the random free movement of the particles, what we are referring to is flux. So what flux is, is the random movement of particles across a surface per unit of time. So particles randomly moving per unit of time. Perfect. So that's flux. So then net flux, we talk about it, is determined by the gradient. So net flux means is the direction in which it's traveled. Okay, so concentration from high to low. And this can occur between two types of cells or two cells. And this is where the gap junction kind of comes into play that we talked about yesterday. So a picture of it, we have two cells essentially, and we have this gap junction. And now the gap junction, what this really is, is there's pores that exist between the two cells and it allows a free movement of ions across through those, um, those pores and they go down their concentration gradient in order to balance it out on both sides. And this is more prevalent when we talk about calcium itself and in myocytes and cardiac myocytes, right? And most muscle cells and cells, what it does is allow calcium to get on either side and this allows for more of a unison and uniform contraction of all the musculature at the same time, okay? It also allows for that rhythmic and unison contraction. And we see that a lot in our cardiac system. We also see that a lot in our GI tract, in our smooth muscles, okay? So it's quite important to understand that that free flow of ions. Now there's characteristics of simple diffusion. We know that we, it moves from higher to lower concentration. It does, it requires 
no energy expenditure at all. And it occurs rapidly over short distances. Okay. But in contrast to that, longer distances takes longer. Makes sense, right? And it is directly related to temperature. Think about how particles move when we heat them up. In the air, let's say it's a really warm room and somebody opens a can of tuna because we all love that one partner that loves doing that. And you can instantly smell it. But if you're in a really cold room and somebody opens a can of tuna, you don't smell it right away. You will eventually, but you don't smell it right away. And the reason for that is as, as particles heat up or as the atmosphere heats up or the area heats up, those particles tend to move a little bit faster, okay? And that's essentially just physics in general. So when we are, when our temperature is high, things in our body are typically moving across membranes and moving and diluting a lot faster. We know that it's inversely related to the size of the molecule. Therefore, the larger the molecule, the slower it crosses the membrane. Okay. And finally, it's dependent on total surface area and thickness of the membrane. Depends on the surface area and thickness of the plasma membrane. Okay. So what that means is it has more distance to go due to the thickness. Therefore, it takes longer to get to the other side, right? Kind of like driving your car uh, across Highway 2. You're trying to get across, it takes a little while. But if you're trying to get across, I don't know, let's say a range road, it takes way less time, right? Kind of the same idea. Now, in contrast, and not so much contrast to that, but in addition to that, we have something that's called facilitated diffusion. facilitated diffusion. Now, polar molecules, essentially ones that have a charge, cannot move across a plasma membrane. Okay, so charged particles cannot move across a plasma membrane. Okay, and so by simple diffusion, they can't move across. Instead, they require a little bit of assistance. We call this assistance facilitated diffusion because we're facilitating its movement across the membrane. So the ion movement across the plasma membrane is facilitated by transporters. Okay? And we see them like this. These guys are called transporters. Now they can be in the form of proteins. They can be in the form of enzymes. Okay. But they have kind of different makeups. And with those makeups, they also allow different substances to across. Now, transporters themselves so, transporters themselves are, are an integral part of the transmembrane, and they're often proteins. And they're embedded into the bilayer, and it spans the entire aspect of the plasma membrane. as you can kind of see here. And they're kind of like this door to a house. You need the right key to open it and it's the entry to the cell, okay? So you have to be the right type of charge, the right type of ion, the right type of particle in order to get into that, that channel and diffuse across. Now the protein can be open to the extracellular fluid, but um, it also can change its conformation to be open to the intracellular fluid. So as you can see here, it is wide open to the extracellular fluid. But if we actually flip this below or flip this underneath, it would be closed off. Okay. So it can change its conformation by kind of flipping back and forth across the plasma membranes, which you will see here in the diagram. So I know we watched this yesterday, but it kind of serves the point. What it does, as you can see here, it's going to flip open. Will it actually flip open? No, it's not going to. But basically what happens here is once all these are saturated, this channel portion right here will close. So this channel portion right here will close. 
and this channel portion right here will open. So it changes its shape. For example, let's talk about, you know, glut, which essentially is a glucose transporter. And all cells basically have this. Now, this is a popular protein, and it's dependent upon the concentration of glucose in the extracellular fluid. So if we have a lot of sugar in the extracellular fluid, and not so much in the intracellular fluid, more and more is going to push across, and it's going to push across super fast. Okay. Now, obviously, I'm not using this channel or reusing this channel as an example, but this would be a glut transporter. So it's going to diffuse across, and what's going to happen is it's going to basically diffuse across with some effort and some force until both sides even up. As the sides even up a little bit, the amount of force or the amount of speed that these are traveling across the membrane slows down quite a bit. Okay. Now, you know, there's also the reverse of that. So if there's more glucose on the inside than on the outside, glucose will shift to the outside of the cell. Okay. And this is actually pretty important when we consider the role of glycogen. Okay. And when we're giving glucagon as a medication, we're going to turn glycogen into sugar. Well, it gets turned into sugar inside the cell. So obviously inside the cell, it has to diffuse outwards. Okay. So there's a finite number of these transporter proteins. Okay. So if we drew a cell out, there's only a finite number of these. So what's going to happen is when they're all full, they can be saturated and therefore no more net flux is going to occur. So we get no more movement of cells. What's going to happen is the sugar on the outside is going to continue to increase. Sugar on the inside is going to maintain that equilibrium. Okay. Now, some of these transporters can be what we call a co-transporter. And they move more than one solute across a plasma membrane. Now, these primarily typically occur in the GI tract and the renal system. All right, and more particularly in the renal tubules. And one of these pumps that is actually quite famous, and we're going to talk about it a little bit more in depth, is called the glucose sodium pump. Okay. We'll talk about that a little bit more in just a few minutes. Now, if the solutes are moving from the extracellular fluid to the intracellular fluid, so they're moving from the outside to the inside, we call this a sim porter. Okay. So if the protein is moving things in, we call it a sim porter. And the reverse of that, if it's going from the ICF to the extracellular fluid, we call this an anti porter. Okay. Now, both of these require two things. Both solutes must be present. And it will only bind to both solutes. So if you have glucose but no sodium, it's not going to go across. So this is why a lot of times when we're giving dextrose, it's usually in a solution of sodium of some sort, or there's sodium in it. Allows for better transportation. All right, so let's talk about some channels and pumps, shall we? So channels and pumps are different than uh, the transporter proteins in that they open or when they open, there is an open column. Okay, so as we can see here, there's a nice open column going from the extracellular fluid to the intracellular fluid. Okay, super open column. And when, because this is open between the two, there's essentially a free flow of ions and solute and solvent. Okay, so basically it's diffusion. So therefore, we do not call this type of diffusion or this type of channel a facilitated channel. Okay, now some of these channels are gated. So what they have is they basically have this 
gate that sits across and it stays closed. All right. And when they open, solute and solvents will flow down their concentration gradient. But the purpose of this gate is to maintain that steady state. And really, we can think of this as the disequilibrium on either side. So it's maintaining this state as its normality. Okay. Now, gated channels are gated like this, gated channels, have three types of mechanisms. Mechanism one, ligand. So ligand requires binding a specific chemical to open. So it requires a chemical to bind to in order to open the channel. And when bound, it opens. So a common one that we know of is acetylcholine, and it binds to the nicotinic muscular receptors in which system? Do we know? It would be the peripheral nervous system. Okay. Another channel we call voltage. So a lot of times you'll hear is voltage gated channel, but really it's the same thing. It's voltage channel. And it requires a specific gradient, specific gradient of electrical charge across the membrane in order to open. Electrical charge gradient exists within the cell. On the outside of the cell, it is primarily negative, but it is more positive than when in relation to the inside of the cell, which is primarily negative. And if you recall from yesterday, it's primarily negative because of proteins that exist within the cell that are unbound. Okay? And proteins carry a negative charge. So once a specific charge or volt occurs either in or outside of the cell, this gate is going to open. Now we see this primarily in your cardiac myocytes as well as your neurons. And this is how action potential is generated. We're going to talk about that way more in depth when we talk about the nervous system. And thirdly, we have mechanical. And they are kind of just like they sound. It requires a specific tension. So it requires tension to open. And this is found in your smooth muscle, specifically your vessels. Moreover, your arteries. And the smooth muscle that's surrounding the vascular lumen carries a tone. Remember we talked about that yesterday? And it carries that base state of contraction, which we call base contractile state. Base contractile state, there we go. Okay. So if there is a dilation in this stretch, so if our artery goes kind of from this to this, this dilation causes a stretch and it causes gates to open, therefore allowing a specific ion across that we know of calcium. And it allows calcium into the cell to enforce contraction. All right, and this bringing the smooth muscle back to its normal state. And therefore we get vasoconstriction. Now with the transporters and channels, movement across the membrane is then by diffusion, okay? So if we recall that, transporters and channels do so by diffusion. All right, the next thing let's talk about is pumps. Okay. So if we consider our plasma membrane, so we'll draw our pump and we'll draw our other side of the membrane. Give ourselves our little tails. Look, it's a mirror image. Okay, so 
The premise of the pumps is to facilitate movement of solutes across the plasma membrane against its concentration gradient. Okay, so it facilitates energy requirement movement against its concentration gradient. Okay, and as a result, we, as we know, as I kind of said there, it requires energy. Okay, so it does require that energy. Now, these pumps are typically enzymatic. What this means is they're either an enzyme or they're made up uh, or they require an enzyme that basically cleave. So if we kind of talked about this a little bit yesterday as well, if you think of a big kinch of cleaver, it takes this atom and essentially splits it into two. So this is your ATP. It splits it into a two ADPs, or an ADP and a phosphate ion. Okay, And it does this, and this reaction here allows for energy. So what happens then is we get a, a let's say this is our ATP molecule. He gets split up into an ADP and a phosphate. Actually, let's do that guy in a different color. An ADP and a phosphate ion. What's going to happen is this guy is going to come over here. He's going to attach himself. And this is going to allow the gate essentially to pump ions back and forth across the plasma membrane. Okay. So this binding carries that energy and the splitting of the atom itself or the, this ADP is the energy that it gets. So some common pumps that we know of or that are kind of famous, you guys will learn to love this one, sodium potassium ATPase pump, the calcium ATPase pump, and the proton potassium ATPase. This one is actually the one that pumps hydrogen ions into your stomach. And lastly, we're going to talk about transmembrane. Transmembrane, sorry, transcellular, I should say. Transcellular transport. Just like it sounds, it's going through the cell. So areas of the body that we use nutrients or materials that need to move across the cell or through the cell to get into the bloodstream. Okay. So for example, let's kind of draw our blood vessel here. So we have our blood vessel, and then we have our associated cell with our little guy right there. And now these cells are super closely packed together. And as you can see, if a glucose uh, ion wants to get across, can't, right? It's got nowhere to go. So what's going to happen is this secondary active transport uh, requires a pump on one side and a where it's kind of pulling the nutrient outside of this matrix and a transporter so it can get out. So if we drew this kind of bigger over here, what we would see is we would have one part of the cell with what looks like a pump. And it's going to pull sodium inside the cell and glucose is going to kind of tag along with it. And on the other side of the cell, we will have this kind of channel protein. Remember how we said that it's kind of free and open. So what's going to happen is this channel protein is going to utilize the sugar itself and 
it's sorry, it's going to pull this sodium in and glucose is going to come with it. Glucose is going to travel across by a simple diffusion over to this, this pro or this transporter, and it's going to diffuse into the blood vessel itself. Okay. So this is what we call secondary active transport. So in summary, the movement of solute across a bilipid layer is dependent on the size and charge of the solubility. Net flux is movement of a solute determined by its gradient. A permeable solute crosses the membrane by simple diffusion moving down its concentration gradient, which is a slow process. In response to that, a non-permeable solute crosses the membrane by facilitated diffusion using transporters, which is a faster process, which requires a gradient and saturable and is specific. The primary act of transport moves solute against its concentration gradient, and this mechanism requires ATP, which is, exhibits specificity and is saturable. And finally, secondary active transport couples the activity of co-transporters with a pump and is used for transcellular transport. So what we're going to talk about now is we are going to talk about uh, osmosis. We're going to talk about the difference between osmolarity and tonicity. And we're going to explain how effective solutes regulate fluid compartments within the body. So it sounds like it's going to be a good time, basically. All right. Water essentially has its own transporter. And we kind of talked about it earlier. And that guy is called the aquaporon. Actually, I should say aquaporin is more politically correct. And it is present in virtually, I, I can't spell today, virtually all cells. And is not gated channel, therefore it's always open. Okay. And this guy is going to become important when we continue on what we're talking about next. But the next thing we're going to talk about, and the kind of the premise of this is osmosis. So osmosis, the first thing to think about is the concentration of water as it moves by facilitated diffusion via the aquaporon. Uh, water is highest when it's pure water. So that means when it's without solutes. So if you add a solute, the concentration of water reduces, if that makes sense. So we need to think about the concentration of water itself, not just, you know, everything that's included in it. Now, if we picture two cells, oh, that's going to be a horrible cell. There we go. So if we picture two cells that are side by side, They have cells have kind of have their own compartments there. There essentially are a compartment within our body that has its own compartment that has its own compartments and each organelle inside the cell has its own compartments as well. And when two cells are close enough or the compartments are close enough, there is an disequilibrium of solute in, on either side. So let's say we have a sodium over here. We have maybe two sodiums over here. And let's say we have four sodiums on this side. So sodium is going to diffuse across, across the plasma membrane. Okay. And it's going to end up over here to equal either side out. Okay. And it's going to move along with water. So as both sides are equal of both water and, uh, and the solute. So therefore volume has not changed. Okay, so there's no change in volume whatsoever. And the compartment sizes essentially are basically the same size. So we would call this diffusion. Right? However, let's have these same two cells again. When there is an impermeable membrane, between these two compartments and it's not going to allow the solutes to move across okay so if these cells are butted up against each other we have the pore we have the gap junction available but if the cells are not either the same cells butted up against each other or they lack the pore or the gap junction itself they have the plasma membrane that kind of stops this process 
Okay. So water, because the solute, so we have sodium, 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 and one more for good measure. And we only have two on this side. What's going to happen is water itself then is going to move and it's going to do it in order to dilute the concentration on either side. So we're going to have water moving over to this side in order to dilute it out. Okay. Therefore, the compartment itself, this cell, is suddenly going to start swelling. Okay. So the amount of solutes haven't changed, but the amount of water now has changed in order to dilute it out and make sure that the concentration on the other side is the same. Okay. And it's important to understand this concept in the fact that osmosis, so this actually is osmosis, it's the movement of water. And this is important when we talk about things like isotonic, hypertonic, hypotonic solutions. When we're, um, you know, we're giving medications, uh, one of the medications you'll learn about is called volubin. And this is a one-to-one -one plasma expander. And what it does is it actually pulls water out of the cell in order to expand the vascular space to increase the amount of perfusion getting to where it needs to be. Okay, so this actually acts on osmosis and utilizes osmosis. Another medication that does that as well is called mannitol. And this, its weird name is osmotrol. Okay, mannitol operates the same way. Okay, it has a high concentration of solute, more specifically, probably sodium. And what it does is it's going to pull water into the vasculature out of the cells to reduce the amount of swelling within the brain. Okay, and interestingly enough, Sodium bicarb does the exact same. So in fact, you actually do carry a volume expander on your truck. Okay. Now, the interesting thing to think about diffusion or osmosis is the actual definition of, of osmosis is the movement of water. So it's the diffusion of water. So before we move along, there's a couple of important terms that we need to talk about. The first one we're going to talk about is molarity. So molarity is the amount of moles. And no, we're not talking about the little guys that live in the ground uh, in a specific volume of fluid. Okay. And one mole equals six times 10 to the power of 23 moles or molecules, which is bloody huge. And therefore the number molarity itself means number of moles per, uh, per volume. Okay. To write a mole, we write with a large M. So capital M. Another term that we need to understand is osmolarity. Now, how many particles are in a solution essentially is what we're talking about in uh, molarity. Okay. Now, osmolarity is the number of moles per volume. So it's the number of moles per volume. And it's actually times the number of particles in molecules number of particles per molecule okay so for example we have one mole of sodium chloride this disassociates into a solution and it creates two particles we get a sodium particle and a chloride particle. Okay, so this would equal two osmolars of sodium chloride. Okay, so we write it as osmolars. So O S M O L A R S. Okay, now there's a term that you guys have probably heard that seems to be interchangeably used. Um, and really, that is kind of the truth, but it's 
osmolality. And this seems to confuse a lot of students and a lot of people. In fact, I was very confused by this for most of my career as a paramedic until I started learning more about it. But really, in biology, there's minimal distinction between osmolality and osmolarity. Osmolality talks about volume, whereas osmolarity talks about the weight of the water itself. So we use these interchangeably. And really, when we're talking about it, we consider them to be equivalent in, in biology. So they're the equivalent. Okay. And in water itself, or um, in, uh, in an osmotic solution that we're talking about, a, a normal solution that you know, we're, we're talking about has 300 milli osmolars. Okay. So if we put a cell into a solution that has the exact same amount of, uh, of moles and, or solutes in the solution, okay, that would be a iso-osmotic solution. So iso meaning the same. So therefore, let's say we have a solution of 200 milliosmolars. Therefore, the concentration would be hypoosmotic. What if the concentration has 400? We would call this hyperosmotic. Okay. Hopefully that's making some sense to you guys. Hyper meaning high, hypo meaning low. The way I remember it is O means low. Now, if we calculate the osmolars, we must calculate all of the particles in the solution. That means each molecule is one milliosmolar or one osmolar. So, for example, if we combine sodium chloride with urea, and urea itself does not disassociate, then we would have three osmolars okay how does that how does that work out well sodium and chloride disassociate into a sodium and a chloride urea like we said does not disassociate so we have a urea molecule therefore we only have three let's think of another example what if we have a sodium chloride and we mix that with a potassium chloride solution actually hold on with a potassium chloride solution. Well, we're gonna have three again. How do you get that? We have a sodium, we have a chloride, we have a potassium, we have another chloride. Therefore, we only have three milliosmolars. Hopefully that makes sense. All right. So let's talk about something that seems to confuse a lot of people as well. Tonicity. In tonicity, we only count the particles that are not penetrating. So what does that mean specifically? Whereas osmolars calculates all of the particles, not penetrating means that they cannot pass the plasma membrane. So for example, again, let's use sodium chloride as our example with urea. Sodium chloride cannot plas. So sodium and chloride ions as disassociated cannot pass the plasma membrane, right? Because they're charged particles now. However, urea itself can because it does not disassociate down. Okay? So urea itself would be a neutral so it would basically be dissolved in water. Therefore, it would fall through the aquaporon and dilute itself in, okay? So because sodium chloride cannot pass the plasma membrane, we would include only these in our calculation. So just like in a isoosmolarity, 
if we have an isotonic solution, the same tonicity on either side, we have 300 milliosmolars. How about that? If we have a solution of, I don't know, say 200 milliosmolars, and again, this is just an example, we would have a, because again, we're always referring back to this, this iso portion, we would have a hypotonic solution. Hopefully you're kind of putting together that the osmolality and the tonicity, or sorry, osmolarity and the tonicity are basically in biology, nearly the same thing. What if we have a solution that has 400, you say? Well, simple. We'd have a hypertonic solution. Now, it's important to think about this when we, again, when we get into our neurology section and we're talking about traumatic brain injuries or increased ICP and drugs like mannitol and sodium bicarb, which are hypertonic solutions. Okay. So if we recall, water always will balance out. Okay. And it's always going to balance out the concentration on either side of the plasma membrane. Okay, so on either side. And it does this by moving across those aquaporon channels, like I said. So why is this important that you guys are probably thinking about, and other than just utilizing different solutions for treatments? Let me tell you a story. A few years back, there was two Boston Marathon runners, and they, during the race, they overhydrated themselves. This diluted their, all of their solutes in their extracellular fluid. This essentially caused the neurons to begin to swell because now we have a hypotonic solution. So we have less concentration within inside the cell and more concentration outside the cell. Okay. And so what's going to happen is cerebral edema occurred. This caused them essentially to die due to increased ICP and eventual herniation. So it's good to know for those athletes in the audience, uh, water legging, bad, bad news. Now, the point here is this, the body will always try and maintain the extracellular fluid at 300 milliosmolars, okay? 300 milliosmolars, always, okay? So water will be able to flow back and forth to whichever has less. So in the fluid compartment, let's talk about this and let's, let's try and maybe work this out together. All right. So let's use arrows. Here we go. Okay. So let's talk about the first one here, an isotonic uh, IV solution. So we're injecting somebody with isotonic IV solution and we're subjecting our cells to this. So increased fluid from an IV, there's really not going to be a lot of change because uh, the total body water, you know, might go up. So our total body water is definitely going to go up. Uh, this might be better. That definitely was not better. There we go. There we go. So total body water is going to go up and the extracellular fluid volume is also going to go up, but the intracellular fluid volume is not going to be, there's not going to be any change. And why might that it, or why might that be? Well, because it's the same uh, tonicity on either side, there's no free water movement, okay? So therefore, the effect is equal. Let's talk about a different one. Let's talk about diarrhea. Diarrhea, we're gonna have a reduced total body water because we are literally crapping it all up for the lack of better expressions. And so therefore, our extracellular fluid volume is gonna reduce. But again, we're not changing the components on either side. We're just losing total body water. And with water that we're losing, we're also lo losing those, those uh, components with it. So therefore, we get no change. And our effect on our extracellular fluid, sorry, this should be an F, not a G. Our extracellular fluid osmolarity, it would be equal. What about excessive salt intake? Are we going to change our total body water? Well, 
well, eventually we're probably going to take a whole lot of fluid in eventually, but you know, for our immediate purposes, not really. So it's neutral. How about our extracellular fluid volume? Think about it. When we take in a lot of salt, where does it go initially? It's going to go into the intravascular space because it can't cross that plasma membrane. What's it going to do? We're going to have an increase in extracellular fluid volume because that salt is taken in and it's increasing the amount of salt in the vascular space. So where is the fluid going to come from? It's going to come from the cells. So therefore, our intracellular fluid volume is going to decline. Okay. And the effect on the extracellular fluid osmolarity is going to go up. Because again, all of those particles that we're counting. How about excessive sweating? Well, when we sweat, we are giving off of fluid, right? Along with that fluid, we're also giving off solutes. So therefore, our extracellular fluid volume, so our, our vascular space, our interstitial space, those fluids are going to go down. What's going to happen to the interstitial fluid volume? Well, if our volume on the outside or on the intervascular space is, is going down, what's going to happen is it's going to hyperconcentrate the solutes that are remaining. So you become dehydrated. So there's more concentration on the vascular side of the, uh, of the cell. And so therefore, we're actually going to get an increase in intracellular fluid volume because water is going to flow from the vascular space, sorry, the, um, uh, the vascular space into the cell. And therefore, our effect on the extracellular fluid osmolarity is going to go up. Okay, hopefully you guys kind of understand that. And in fact, I might actually correct myself there. The excessive sweating component. Sorry, I'm just going to correct myself here. And I realize I just said this. So the extracellular fluid component, as we know, this is going to go down. This is going to go down. Obviously, this is going to go up. But what's going to happen is, like I said, sweating, we get rid of the solutes as well. So we're losing volume plus solutes. Therefore, the amount of solutes inside the cell itself are going to be higher compared to the extracellular volume. Okay. So we are going to have water that's going to flow from the cell or from the vascular space into the intracellular fluid volume. Okay. And that's going to cause the volume to expand because of that change in particles. Okay. So we're going to have a lot more sodium on the inside of the cell than on the outside of the cell. Therefore, water is going to flow towards and try and even it out. Okay. Sorry. I just had to correct myself there. All right, so before we finish, let's summarize. There's two fluid compartments of the body and we call that the ICF and the ECF and they're in osmotic balance. Okay, so they're in osmotic balance. The two compartments. Water moves by facilitated diffusion. Okay, and it does this through aquaporons. Okay, and we do, we know that this is called osmosis, the diffusion of water. There's no permeable solutes called effective solutes. Solutes, or sorry, uh, cell volume is critically dependent on a steady state of effective solutes. Okay. Um, so therefore, the water will cross the cell membrane in exchange with extracellular fluid. So essentially, water moves to equalize the concentration of solutes. when the particles cannot cross the plasma membrane. Okay. And finally, cells shrink in hypertonic, what happened there? I'm just gonna 
a second here. Cells shrink in a hypertonic solution. And cells will actually swell in hypotonic solutions.